Welcome to module one in the Vibrant Food Zoomers modules in the Functional Academy. What we'll cover today in this module will be an overview and understanding of immunoglobulins, especially IgG and IgA. We'll discuss proteins and peptides as they relate to testing for food sensitivities and antibodies. And then we'll walk through the basic understanding of lectin zoomer and dairy zoomer from an interpretation standpoint, as well as recommended interventions. So the first thing to understand about immunoglobulins is they are immune mediated reactions. Anything involving the immune system involves in some form or another immunoglobulins or an immune complex. These are hypersensitivities and there are different types of hypersensitivities based on which immunoglobulins uh, participate in that reaction. We have four different main types of hypersensitivities. Type one is an allergy. So this is what we commonly associate with anaphylaxis. Um, these are patients who have a very severe and acute immediate reaction to the allergen, usually food, but could be something else environmental such as a bee sting um, or pollen. Type two, three, and four are non-allergy hypersensitivities. Uh, they involve either antibodies or chemical mediators. And then we have non-immune mediated reactions like food intolerances. Um, lactose intolerance is a very good example of this or a bile salt deficiency in which somebody cannot adequately digest uh, fats. These three terms, allergies, sensitivities, and intolerances are often mistakenly used interchangeably but they each mean something completely different clinically. So it's important to understand that these three terms are not interchangeable when we're talking about how somebody reacts to a food. Um, especially sensitivities and intolerances, those two get often used in place of each other and they really do not mean the same thing. So it's important to understand the terminology of, of hypersensitivities versus intolerances first before we move on. So the main types of hypersensitivities that will involve the immune system, we won't talk about type two since that's more of a uh, complement system, um, but the antibodies are going to be specific to each foreign substance being tested. So if I have antibodies to casein protein, those antibodies will only re recognize and bind to casein protein they will not recognize and bind to whole milk protein or whey or anything else in milk. Um, so it's important to understand that the shapes are very, very specific. If you, you know, remember learning about this probably in biology class somewhere, and they use the analogy of a lock and key. The key to your front door only opens your front door. It doesn't open your neighbor's front door, and it doesn't open your... Uh, basement door, perhaps, or your car. So antibodies function the same way. Um, the key to casein only fits into casein, and similarly with any other protein shape. You can also look at these types of reactions in terms of which mediators and mechanisms are involved. And type 1, of course, because this is a allergy hypersensitivity, we have mast cell involvement because mast cell degranulation is part of that. Type 3 are the ones that we're looking at today with the food zoomers and talking about food sensitivities in general. These are your immunoglobulins G, M, and A. Um, and there's, of course, um, some involvement with T cells and B cells that happen before these immunoglobulins get involved. So specifically talking about type three hypersensitivities, the mechanism behind this is that an antigen, which is just a foreign protein, presents itself and is recognized as foreign or a threat. What this means is our immune system simply views this antigen as non-self. Um, the basics of this, uh, hopefully, you know, if you've already watched the wheat zoomer modules, um, there's some discussion about recognition by the immune system, but essentially the immune system is constantly surveying everything, and especially in the gastrointestinal lumen, this is going on um, consistently all the time. It's constantly surveying all of the proteins present, and it recognizes self, meaning cells, um, our own 
enzymes, anything else that belongs to us, our immune, sec our immune system recognizes as us. It then recognizes anything that's not us as a foreign protein and sometimes a threat depending on what that foreign protein is. So um, a commensal bacteria is still potentially seen as a threat, even though it's good and it's helpful, too much of it or it coming too close to our intestinal epithelial cells will still trigger an intense immune response. Um, and then we also have overt threats like lipopolysaccharide generated by gram-negative bacteria. So these are all examples of antigen recognition. Antibodies will be produced specific to that antigen and they will bind to the antigen to neutralize it um, by binding to it, they prevent it from binding to anything else. That's the key point to understand here is that these antibodies are being generated so that they can go around searching for this antigen anywhere in the body and prevent it from binding to anything else. And in doing so, an immune complex is formed. An immune complex just means that it is an antibody and antigen bound together as a complex protein. These immune complexes insert themselves or can insert themselves into small blood vessels, joints, tissues, um, glomeruli in the kidney. And this, this is what causes systemic inflammatory symptoms. Now it's important to understand that IgG primarily is what does this some, to some extent IgM. IgA does not do this. Um, these immune complexes with IgA are actually in the lumen of the intestine and there's the secretory IgA um, action in which those are actually excreted through the stool and they do not cross back into the body and, and bind to anything else. So if we're talking about systemically, we're talking specifically IgG and IgM immune complexes. These immune complexes are also far more capable of interacting with complement proteins to form medium-sized complexes, which means even larger complexes that then um, when there is a lot of this antigen, they become highly pathogenic because they're deposited in these tissues at a much faster rate. So these new immune complexes induce inflammatory response in the tissue, which then causes damage to the tissue. So if we're talking about the joints or the thyroid or the brain, think about the damage and inflammation that's being induced by immune complexes where the initial antigen, perhaps it's casein or butyrophilin or some other protein from a food, has been bound by an antibody, deposited in a tissue, and now this damage is occurring. The damage is as a result of the action of cleaving the complement anaphylotoxins, which that goes beyond the discussion of this particular type of testing, but just know that that is a side effect of it. And then that mediates mast cell degranulation. So there is actually a component here where mast cells are involved, even though we typically tend to think of those as IgE um, involved, they do have some involvement downstream in IgG and IgM, and that's part of the inflammatory response. And then of course, inflammatory cells are uh, recruited into the tissue to essentially break down or destroy these immune complexes, and that leads to further tissue damage. So this is sort of the action or mechanism behind why these antibodies might be inflammatory, with the exception of IgA. So let's start with IgA. Um, IgA antibodies are found in areas of the body where there is a mucosal lining. So these are the, the respiratory tract starting from the nose, uh, the breathing passages down into the lungs, the digestive tract, ears, eyes, and vaginal lining. This is where we have mucosal surfaces. And these surfaces, if you think about it, are exposed to the outside or to the environment. Um, they come in contact with the air, with food, or with some other foreign substance on a regular basis. And so these mucosal surfaces have a large amount of IgA antibodies there present um, in order to act as a first line of defense. So mucosal immunity is incredibly important here. And IgA is not necessarily a bad thing. When we see IgA antibodies to something, it does not necessarily mean that that something is very wrong because again, these antibodies do not deposit in tissues as immune complexes. Um, these are more a sign that exposure to an antigen has happened and mucosal immunity has handled it and reacted and um, you know that, that thing is inflammatory, uh, 
but we're, we've got it under control. So just something to kind of keep in mind. In the gut, these IgA antibodies can also bind to the mucosal layer on top of the epithelial cells and form a barrier that can neutralize threats before they reach the cell. And that's really an important feature of what IgA does in the gut is it forms essentially a coating in the mucus, which again is also a protective barrier, but the mucus houses some of our, our commensal and, and possibly opportunistic bacteria. So IgA is just there as sort of an ins insurance policy um, for the epithelial cells as that, as that line of defense. IgA antibodies are considered non-inflammatory. Um, and so again, what that means is they do not stimulate inflammatory processes in the body the way IgG does. They do not necessarily indicate inflammation. They indicate mucosal immunity has occurred. They are created in response to a foreign antigen, usually microbial. Um, they, they participate in a very complex communication back and forth between the host and the um, microbial ecosystem that, re that resides mostly in the gut, but of course we do have microbes covering our entire exterior as well as every other mucosal surface in the body. Um, so, you know, we have bacteria, yeast, viruses, parasites, and then of course some of those microbes produce toxins. Um, you know, for instance, candida, parasites do, certain gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive cam as well. So then we can also generate them in response to pollutants or toxins that we come in contact with because again, it's a foreign antigen and this is mucosal immunity or protection. And um, they might be generated in response to foods which are undigested or recognized as foreign proteins. In the intestinal lumen, they are indica in indicative excuse me, of an immune response stimulated by T cell to B cell interaction. Um, so the, the T cell B cell stimulation by an antigen particularly bacterial, but it could be something else too, will also stimulate production of IgA to that antigen after it's presented. Um, and so it's important to understand that healing interventions, when you have an individual with a lot of IgA antibodies, healing interventions may need to target Th1 and Th2 balance, upregulating Treg production. Um, and so if you have not already watched the wheat zoomer modules, I would encourage you to go back and watch those because we get into a good discussion of exactly what that means. The Th1, Th2, as well as Th17 immune responses, understanding how those work, where they come from, and how they affect our response to things in our environment, including our food. And then we'd get into a you know, pretty good discussion of Tregs, how to upregulate those, um, how to keep balance and calm um, and peace in the immune system in the gut. So that would be a good place to start when talking about how to rebalance this. IgA antibodies um, are found in all body fluids. They are the smallest of the antibodies, but they're also the most common. They make up about 75 to 80% of our antibodies, <clears throat> excuse me, found throughout our entire body. They're very important in fighting infections, um, and they are also the only type of antibody that can cross the placenta. They do indicate exposure to a specific antigen, but they do not always necessarily indicate active inflammation. However, may contribute to it in a dose-dependent manner. What that means is that IgG indicates exposure to an antigen. For instance, if you run food sensitivity testing and it says that you have IgG antibodies to romaine lettuce, you've been exposed to undigested proteins in romaine lettuce but it doesn't necessarily mean that romaine lettuce provokes an immune response as far as inflammation goes. Um, so this is, this is one thing to consider with IgG antibodies. So why we measure both IgA and IgG? Some people do not produce much or any IgA antibodies. Um, this would be like a primary immunoglobulin deficiency. And that can happen with IgG. There are some individuals with um, immunoglobulin G deficiencies. However, it's more rare. We wouldn't know if someone has formed reactivity to an antigen if we didn't also check IgG levels or in the case of IgG deficiency, IgA levels. Um, why we're looking at IgA is that some IgG antibodies are not a good indicator of actual inflammation. So again, what we just talked about, 
Uh, they simply might just mean exposure and the immune system tracking this. And after several months of not being exposed again, the immunoglobulin levels will decline. Um, but there may not necessarily be a reaction produced. However, IgA antibodies coupled with IgG can indicate a little bit stronger or a much stronger immune response to an antigen in some cases. IgG and IgA testing at the protein level. So this is what the food sensitivity test looks at. We're looking at whole protein, which is actually technically extract. Um, and this is how all food sensitivity tests operate. Um, they are pretty much all extract level, which means the whole protein, but there may be residues of carbohydrate and lipid based um, particles as well in there. So they're not pure protein. That's what food sensitivity testing does. This will quantify your specific IgG and IgA to the whole protein of that food. Um, the strengths of it are that it's a pretty good, accurate measure of IgG and IgA to a specific protein. It can be good for associating those type 3, remember your IgG, IgA, and IgM, type 3 hypersensitivity reactions involving complexes, um, which again, IgA does not form complex, but IgG does. And that would be more so based on symptoms. So if you have individuals with joint pain or migraines or other systemic inflammatory symptoms, um, you can more easily associate those with foods when you have this, this type of testing. Um, if IgG is pathogenic, meaning if it is forming those immune complexes and being deposited into tissues where it is inducing inflammation, this is useful. Where it may not necessarily be useful is IgG can be a protective antibody and a high amount of IgG may, not, may actually be a good thing. It may just simply mean that the, the immune system is handling this and there's nothing necessarily bad about that. Um, IgG and IgA antibodies represent the whole proteins being presented to the immune system, which can also indicate that a patient lacks sufficient digestive capacity to break down proteins. And that's why whole proteins are being presented to the immune system, which really technically shouldn't happen. So when we test at the peptide level, this is the food zoomers tests. At the peptide level, because there's such a high level of antibody specificity, cross-reactivity is minimized if not completely eliminated. Um, so the concept of foods that cross-react, for instance, gluten might cross-react with other foods that are similarly shaped. There's some molecular mimicry. And therefore, if you are sensitive to gluten, you should eliminate those other foods. When we break down the peptides in gluten and test for those, we know with 100% certainty that what we are picking up is antibodies to gluten and not to those cross-reactive foods. So antibodies are so specific that individual peptides in cow's milk will not bind to cow's milk protein or, or antibodies to cow's milk protein and vice versa. So we could see individuals making antibodies to peptides in cow's milk protein, um, like within casein or whey, for instance, but they may not make antibodies to whole cow's milk protein. And that would be a more accurate assessment of whether or not that individual is sensitive to that particular protein. And this diagram simply just demonstrates how specific those shapes can be, where you would see that the antibody on the right would not bind to the antigen on the left and vice versa because the shapes are so specific. One other concept to understand about this is loss of oral tolerance. This is simply just a term used to describe when somebody develops a sensitivity, they've lost oral tolerance. Um, there may be symptoms accompanying this or not, um, and it's usually a commonly consumed food um, or semi-regularly consumed food, and there's production of inflammatory cytokines and or antibodies in response to continued exposure to the food. So simply just, I've been eating a food and now I have antibodies to this. Um, maybe I have symptoms when I eat it as well. It requires eliminating the food for three to four weeks if we're talking about IgA antibodies or up to three to six months, depending on the food and the, um, the frequency that the person eats it and the severity or, or level of antibodies if we're talking about IgG, for those antibodies to disappear. 
Disappearance of antibodies does not necessarily guarantee that oral tolerance has been reestablished though. So that's important to understand upon retesting a patient, if the antibodies are gone, really what that indicates is that that person has done a good job of eliminating that food and not consuming it. Possibly that this immune response has been um, eliminated, but the only way to know would be to then reintroduce the food and retest after a few months um, just to make sure that there's no antibodies being produced to it. Usually in order to make sure that to, to guarantee that those antibodies are not going to come back, the intestinal barrier needs to be healed, which is usually at the root of some of this. And again, those Th1 and Th2 immune response balance. So let's dive into proteins and peptides and talk about what the food zoomers are actually testing um, and where the strengths in this are. So this diagram right here describes what you're getting on food sensitivity testing. And this is not just Vibrance food sensitivity test, this is everyone else who runs food sensitivity testing. All labs are testing whole protein. So if you look in that red circle, that kind of globular looking, wadded up protein shape is what's being tested on food sensitivity tests. It's a large protein. It is in its whole form. It's undigested and it is what would be present in the food before digestion happens. So hydrochloric acid should be breaking this down. Proteases should be breaking this down. Um, but, but we're testing an undigested protein. Okay. The food zoomers on the other hand, over there on the left, are testing peptides within a protein. So these peptides, essentially the entire protein, we, we take that big globular looking protein, we flatten it out, um, we basically test for all of the little links in the chain. Um, if you think of a string of pearls, we take all the little snippets along that string and we test them individually to see how reactive is this person to this, because this on the left, the food zoomers, where it's, it shows the little um, snippet that it's testing, that is what is actually going to be present in your intestinal lumen after you eat food. It is going to be digested and broken down, and that is what's going to be potentially exposed to your immune system. What's on the right would rarely be exposed to your immune system unless you have some digestive insufficiency, which we'll get into. This is another way of looking at this concept. Um, this big, large, globular shape, multicolored, would be an example of a whole protein. So this might be cow's milk protein. And the smaller protein within the larger protein on the right, so the red one, for instance, might be beta casein. Antibodies to cow's milk protein, if this whole protein right here is cow's milk, would not bind to beta casein. You can see how it would be very obvious that the shape would not be the same for those antibodies. So we can't, we would not have cross reactivity there. But then this could also represent beta casein as the big globular protein and perhaps the red smaller protein might represent a peptide within beta casein. So this can, basically this information can be extrapolated to many levels of magnification of proteins and peptides. Limitations of whole protein food sensitivity testing are that you're making an assumption that the gut barrier is intact and functional, so there's no leaky gut present. If an individual has that leaky gut syndrome, the food sensitivity tests that are whole protein are basically going to reflect that that person has been eating those foods, and that's all. It's not necessarily a good record of which foods may be stimulatory to the immune system. There's also an assumption being made that hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes are sufficient for adequate proteolysis, which of course is breaking down those proteins into smaller peptides. Um, so there's a number of, of limitations in that line of thinking. Primarily, patients that are coming into your office, for instance, with digestive problems or inflammatory conditions and symptoms commonly have hypochlorhydria and deficiencies of enzymes and or bile acids. So sometimes they may not necessarily have low stomach acid. It might be normal or it might even be hyperchlorhydria, but they may have imbalances of enzymes or bile, which then changes the pH and which then of course in the wrong pH, certain things don't work in, um, including enzymes. 
Um, so if enzymes can't work because the pH is not correct, protein breakdown does not continue to happen in the small intestine. So most of these patients also have moderate to severe impairment of that intestinal barrier. Most of them do have leaky gut in some form. Um, whole protein food sensitivity testing then just becomes a food intake record of what that person's been eating and not breaking down and then suggests barrier permeability, but it's not gonna give you specifics as far as what in the intestinal barrier is being um, broken down or what's dysfunctional. It's not gonna give you the patterns of zonulin and anti-zonulin, anti-actin, whether or not LPS is present. So, so consider that it's also not really a good tool to detect intestinal permeability simply because it's not giving you the patterns of those actual intestinal tight junction proteins. So then if we go back to peptide level testing, reproducibility on this test is higher. Um, Vibrant has actually um, made reproducibility reports for our tests, and I, I'm not aware of any other laboratories that do this, but we essentially take one sample, we run it over the course of multiple days, multiple times per day, and it is it basically exactly the same every single time we run it. So our reproducibility is higher, especially with pr the peptide level testing. It doesn't rely on the sufficiency of hydrochloric acid or enzymes. Um, so we, we take that out of the picture. We eliminate cross-reactivity because again, when we're looking at those peptides within each protein, those peptides are not going to have molecular mimicry to other proteins that are unrelated. The antibodies are highly specific to the peptides. They are not going to be generalized or larger antibodies, such as what we would find with whole proteins. So cross-reactivity, again, is going to be eliminated. And then we're able to measure thousands of peptides in one whole protein for a full spectrum of reactivity. This is another way of looking at this. Um, the blue shapes represent immunoglobulins, so those are our antibodies. Um, think of it like this. Food sensitivity testing has one big, large globular protein for each food, and the antibody for that is very specific. It's only going to bind to that. However, with the food zoomers, we've taken that big, large globular protein, and we've broken it down into its you know, unraveled chain, if you want to think of it that way, and we test for all of the snippets along that chain. And so antibodies to anything in that protein can detect reactivity, whereas the food sensitivity tests that you're gonna run into are only gonna test reactivity to an undigested food protein. Food zoomers are going to test the entire spectrum of possible reactivity. So it's not going to miss something, essentially. So to summarize that point, IgA and IgG represent sensitivities based on the presentation of an antigen, which is a foreign protein, to our adaptive immune system. Some IgG antibodies might be inflammatory, while others might be protective. IgA antibodies indicate the immune system's attempt to neutralize a threat, but do not directly generate inflammation. When we lose oral tolerance to a food, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can never consume that food again, you would want to assess the severity of the reaction or symptoms, the level of the antibodies, and the type of the antibodies, whether it's IgG, IgA or IgG, and then make a call on how long elimination should last for that. But you always want to retest barrier permeability before reintroduction. So rerun that wheat zoomer, or at the very least, the intestinal permeability panel before reintroducing foods, just to confirm that it has fully healed. You want to see no antibodies elevated on that. The majority of food sensitivity testing on the market is for whole protein or extract level. This is limited by the functional digestive status and intestinal barrier integrity of the patient, which again, those two things are in question in most patients being seen in functional practices. Antibodies to whole proteins will not bind to peptides and vice versa. So you, you're going to have quite a few individuals slip through the cracks where their whole protein food sensitivity test would not indicate reaction, but a peptide level test will. And in fact, at, at Vibrant, we've run some internal analytics and found that somewhere between 25 and 30% of individuals will not show antibodies to the whole protein form on a food sensitivity test. However, on one of the food zoomers to those foods in question, 
do have antibodies to the peptides within that. So wheat, eggs, um, dairy, et cetera. Rarely will a person's immune, resist, immune system be exposed only to the whole protein form of food. So this is the really critical point to understand here. Rarely is the whole protein form of foods actually presented to the immune system um, once it reaches the small intestine. Therefore, the peptide level testing provides the most accurate measurement of reactivity to a food based on realistic conditions, what the patient would actually experience. So let's jump into lectin zoomer. Um, this particular test includes a handful of lectins and a handful of aquaporins, and we'll talk about the difference between the two. Um, but just know that these are some of the more common lectins, the ones that people are going to consume more frequently, uh, as well as aquaporins. So the difference between lectins and aquaporins, lectins are sugar binding proteins found in both animals and plants, which can bind to carbohydrate structures on cells. Aquaporins are water channels found in cells um, on the cell membrane in both plants and animals, again, um, some of which can cross-react, meaning that the aquaporin in a plant might cross-react with the aquaporin in a human, therefore antibodies to one could bind to the other, leading to primarily neurological symptoms is what they've been attributed to in human populations. So let's take a step back and discuss how problematic are lectins, because there's some controversy and disagreement here. Most of the studies that show cell toxicity in humans, as far as lectins being toxic to human cells, are done using extremely cytotoxic lectins. So, so um, ricin, for example. Uh, ricin is, is a commonly used biological warfare element because it is so cytotoxic not from commonly consumed legumes or grains, however, so not in, or they're not in the form that we would consume them. Um, or they may use them commonly consumed legumes and grains, but they're only done in animal models, so primarily mice, rats, and pigs. The assumption from these two types of studies is being made that the similarities between the human and animal gut glycosylation, so glycosylation is that process of sugar binding, are close enough in humans and animals that these animal results could be extrapolated to human conclusions. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't yet been demonstrated thoroughly. So the glycosylation that's seen in animal gut studies has not yet really been demonstrated in human gut studies to be highly replicable. Lectins do have biological activity in the human body. Um, they've actually been used as cancer treatment mechanisms because they can agglutinate cancer cells. Uh, they are cytotoxic to cancer cells and they can actually carry things like chemotherapy across cancer cell membranes. Um, a study in rats did show that administration of phytohemagglutinin tissue transglutaminase activity increased response to lectin-induced hyperplasia of the small intestinal mycosa, mucosa. So in animal models, again, we, we are seeing that lectins can bind to those small intestinal epithelial cells and cause inflammation in the cell. What's more likely is that, and what we do see more frequently, I guess, as far as human studies go, is that lectins can facilitate translocation of bacterial endotoxins across the epithelial barrier. So if, for instance, on the vibrant wheat zoomer, seeing antibodies to wheat germagglutinin is possibly more an indication of intestinal permeability um, than necessarily all lectin sensitivity because that lectin from wheat can actually help endotoxin cross the barrier of the intestinal lining. So the majority of studies performed show, that show hemagglutinizing effects, so this would be um, agglutinating red blood cells, for instance, in lectins, are done in animals. So again, we don't have good human studies that show this. And they usually use raw lectin consumption. Um, or if they're cooked lectins, they're not pressure cooked, which pressure cooking decreases or eliminates the lectin structure um, and, and renders it inert, essentially. So there are some limitations to this, where if we are studying this in animals and we're showing that raw lectins provide hemagglutinizing effects, humans are not consuming raw lectins the majority of the time. There are a few probably that we do consume. If, if we go back to the list, um, 
you know, we might consume peanuts raw, um, uncooked, of course, we might consume cucumber uncooked. So there would be some examples here where, you know, tomatoes, for instance, um, bell peppers, but some of the more problematic ones that are being used in these studies are grain and legume lectins, which we do not consume uncooked. So something to keep in mind, um, or if they are cooked again, they're not pressure cooked. Some things shown in animal studies, just to kind of be aware of, is that some lectins do bind to epithelial cells. So again, they do have the capacity to do that and may generate inflammation along the intestinal tract. It just hasn't been well established in human populations yet. They can cause GI discomfort. Again, this in animal studies might still carry over to humans, we're not sure. But nutrient malabsorption is probably the most concerning side effect of that. Um, however, there have been some animal studies that have also shown that lectins can promote an increase in metabolism of nutrients that do actually increase fat loss seen, um, which is kind of a positive side effect that you wouldn't expect to see. So just some things to know about lectins as far as um, they're potentially problematic, potentially neutral, and in some individuals, even potentially um, you know, beneficial. Why would we want to measure sensitivity to lectins? Um, on the food zoomers, the lectins are not included in the tests, with the exception of the wheat zoomer. So peanut zoomer, egg zoomer, dairy zoomer, soy zoomer, et cetera, none of those have lectins listed on them um, besides the wheat zoomer. So we have a specific test looking at those as a really nice way of examining what somebody may be reacting to across a very broad group of foods. A food zoomer could be non-reactive. So uh, we have an example here coming up with a, a case study of an individual with corn um, where, which I believe is next. Yeah, so you could have a food sensitivity test, um, a food zoomer, and then a lectin zoomer. And if you notice, the corn zoomer for this individual, this was a 13 year old girl, um, her corn zoomer was completely negative. She didn't make any antibodies to any of the peptides in corn. She did make antibodies to corn on the lectin zoomer, but did not make antibodies to corn on the food sensitivity test. So it's important to understand that the lectin zoomer, so in, if this individual had only had a food sensitivity test and a corn zoomer run, and let's say she needs to be gluten-free, she probably would have been told it's okay to go ahead and eat corn because it doesn't appear that you're reactive to corn. However, the lectin zoomer says, nope, actually you are, you're reactive to corn lectin, so you shouldn't be eating that food. Um, so, you know, that cuts out a large degree of gluten-free foods that people tend to fall back on. Um, this is a really great example where a lectin zoomer would be a great test to run alongside a wheat zoomer if you detect somebody who needs to be gluten-free, it's great to be able to tell them whether or not corn or rice, for instance, would be acceptable foods for them based on these results. Conditions that may have association with lectins. So the, again, the research in humans is in its infancy. We're kind of only scratching the surface right now. So what we can say is we know that there are a lot of case studies with arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, um, connective tissue disorders. Gastrointestinal inflammation does seem to be established as far as case studies and um, kind of observational reported, but, there, but there's not great human studies showing in vivo lectin action yet. Um, hopefully those will be, you know, hopefully with the tool like the lectin zoomer it will be easier to detect that. Um, intestinal permeability is also suggested and possibly cancer in established cancer patients. Um, and that specifically was, that study looked at peanut agglutinin um, specifically. So that's not all lectins, but, and it's also not everyone, it would be somebody who already has cancer. We really can't say that peanut lectin causes cancer in individuals who don't have it. Um, so, so we're not, not there yet as far as research goes. Let's move on to aquaporins to understand a little bit about what these are. These are water channels on the membrane of cells, which essentially just control the flow of fluid in between um, the cell and its environment to keep balance on either side of the cell membrane. Um, every 
animal or plant has them to some extent on their cell membranes and they are a critical component of cellular function. Aquaporin and cross reactivity is what's very important to understand with the lectin zoomer because the aquaporins we're looking at have structural homology to aquaporin 4, which is found in the human body. Um, when you consume the reactive food and develop antibodies to the aquaporin in that food, let's say it's tomato, um, there's a high risk for developing autoantibodies to human aquaporin 4, which can cause neurological damage because human aquaporin 4 is commonly found in neurons um, and, and cells in the, the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Aquaporin 4 antibodies are included on the neural zoomer plus. Uh, so for instance, if you are testing an individual with the lectin zoomer and you find aquaporin 4 antibodies, it's a good idea to run a neural zoomer plus, especially if that person has history of concussions or other blood brain barrier damage, or if they are already demonstrating neurological decline or autoimmunity. So for instance, this might be somebody with memory problems or balance problems or, you know, um, tingling, numbness, ataxia, the whole spectrum of neurologically associated disorders and symptoms. Conditions that have association with aquaporins, um, primarily we're looking at neurological autoimmunity. There, there may be other associations as far as autoimmunity goes, but this is where the body of research has focused in humans. We know for sure that there are connections to neuromyelitis optica. So with individuals with vision problems or worsening vision problems or eye pain, this would certainly be a good reason to run a neural zoomer plus because it's gonna look at multiple antibodies associated with that. Um, systemic lupus erythematous, this has a connection to neuromyelitis optica. There's a small subset of SLE patients that have this condition or risk for it, and you will see aquaporin-4 antibodies in those individuals. Blood-brain barrier permeability is highly probable when you see aquaporin antibodies, especially if you're looking at running a neural zoomer plus on someone, you would want to be looking at antibodies to the blood-brain barrier structures as well. Um, usually blood-brain barrier breach would precipitate aquaporin-4 derived autoimmunity. There would have to be some way for those aquaporin-4 antibodies to get into the brain. Um, and so you would assume that there would be some blood-brain barrier permeability, at least at some point in that individual's life. Um, maybe some also some connections to peripheral demyelination as well. So what do you do with the results on a lectin zoomer? Um, any IgA antibodies would warrant immediate elimination regardless of whether they're moderate or positive. This is a shorter term antibody. This is something that's generating inflammation right now, typically since the half-life of an IgA antibody is six to 10 days. So it's, it's significantly shorter than IgG. IgG moderate antibodies should be eliminated in the short term, rotated after a 30 to 60 day elimination. Um, and after assessing the status of intestinal permeability. So if you've run a wheat zoomer alongside your lectin zoomer, you have a baseline for that individual's intestinal permeability, their leaky gut. You would want to rerun at least the intestinal permeability panel before reintroducing any of these reactive foods. You wanna confirm that there are no antibodies on that intestinal permeability panel anymore. If there are still antibodies, even if they've come down, it's still not healed. You want to continue your healing protocol until it is until you retest and get a completely clean leaky gut panel um, before reintroducing. IgG moderate antibodies to aquaporins in the presence of neurological symptoms should be in a long-term elimination. Um, so for instance, again, if you had tomato aquaporin and you run a neural zoomer plus or this individual has neurological symptoms, that should be eliminated long-term because of the association between aquaporin-4 in the human body. And it would also be a good idea to run a neural zoomer plus if you do see these aquaporin antibodies, just to get a baseline for those aquaporin-4 antibodies in the brain. IgG positive results, so these are your really elevated IgG, those should be eliminated long-term, only reintroduced after 90 or more days, and a confirmation of an intact intestinal barrier. So let's say that you have IgG antibodies to kidney bean and 
um, mung bean. And you retest the intestinal permeability or the wheat zoomer after 90 days, and you still have antizonulin antibodies or antiactin antibodies. You wouldn't reintroduce those foods until you retest that wheat zoomer or intestinal permeability panel and you see it completely clean. If inflammatory symptoms or conditions persist after elimination, you would want to just assess the, the status of comorbid autoantibodies or inflammatory conditions and make the best clinical decision based on that patient's unique set of circumstances. So there may what that means is that there may be something else causing inflammation that may not be related to the food at all. And that's pretty common. Usually foods are not the underlying cause of inflammation. The antibodies to these foods are simply a byproduct of immune stimulation by something and oxidative stress. Here's another way to look at this, basically the same information in a little bit more visual form. IgA moderate or positive, um, IgG moderate, IgG positive. And then if you have IgG moderate or positive with neurological disorders or symptoms, um, you would want to be looking at a neural zoomer plus. That would be kind of a critical tool to determining what may be going on because you may identify that this individual, perhaps a viral infection is what really triggered everything. And the, and the viral panel on that neural zoomer plus is critical to that with blood brain barrier permeability, that autoimmunity could have started there and then trickled over into systemic inflammation or vice versa. Um, so again, if you are retesting that wheat zoomer or intestinal permeability panel, you do wanna see those markers on there, um, zonulin, antizonulin, antiactin. And then of course, if you did have an anti-LPS, you'd wanna see those negative too. All right, so the dairy zoomer, um, this is a, just like the lectin zoomer, a peptide level assessment of the full spectrum of immune response possible to proteins in cow's milk dairy. So some things to understand about the dairy zoomer is that this is specific only to cow's milk. Um, some proteins in cow's milk are similar enough in molecular structure to have enough homology to goat or sheep's milk that these other milks may be potentially inflammatory to some individuals. We, so the translation really means that we cannot say for sure that this individual with positive antibodies to peptides in cow's milk is only sensitive to cow's milk. They might also be sensitive to these proteins if found in goat or sheep's milk too. Um, there's, not, there's not often enough difference structurally in some of these peptides between those three species of, of animal that there would be enough difference in the antibodies produced. The oral challenge of alternative milks might be warranted, but use your best clinical judgment. So in cases like this where antibodies would be, where essentially the peptides in beta casein and cow's milk might be so similar or, or exactly the same thing as in goat or sheep's milk, um, and or a test would not be able to differentiate. Um, an oral challenge might be appropriate. Um, again, I would caution you in doing this after an initial elimination period and you know, confirming that the intestinal barrier is healed and the individual is not inflamed and sick. Those would not be circumstances under which I would do an oral challenge of potentially problematic food. Um, but an oral challenge simply just means that you would have the individual try a small amount of goat milk, for instance, um, over the course of three to five days to see if they react to it or if symptoms are produced and keeping a very detailed food record and symptom record <clears throat> to determine if that food was problematic. However, symptoms are not always obvious and patients may not associate a symptom with something they consumed hours or even days ago. So this is a limitation to an oral challenge is that um, some individuals produce antibodies without very obvious symptoms happening. And this is, this is the case, especially when you run into individuals with positive wheat zoomers um, that claim that they don't feel anything at all when they eat gluten. I feel fine when I eat it. I don't have any trouble eating it, yet they have a really reactive wheat zoomer. Obviously, that's an inflammatory food to them. There's also the concept of relative normalcy, and patients may not be associating symptoms with foods because those symptoms are occurring hours later or days later in some cases, um, or perhaps it's a symptom that the patient has had for so long that they don't even consider it a symptom. Um, perhaps waking up in the morning, feeling incredibly tired and joints aching is just what they assume is their normal, 
um, because someone somewhere told them that, oh, you're just getting older. So they don't associate that with inflammation. And so they're not going to associate it as an inflammatory symptom with a food, um, if that makes sense. So there's some problems with making judgments based on simply oral challenge, um, unless you're, you're really thoroughly coaching the patient on what to look for, how to keep a food diary and record what they're eating. So let's go back to what the Dairy Zoomer does test for. So when you're running any kind of food sensitivity testing, what you're testing over there on the left is the basically the extract of the food. So it has the dry milk solids. It's going to have residues of the sugars and fats in milk, so the lactose and milk fat, um, and it is going to have protein as well. The Dairy Zoomer is taking each of those peptides, actually, sorry, these are actually proteins. Um, caseins, for instance, and lactoglobulin are considered proteins because they're larger, they have a, a certain amount of amino acids in them, but we're breaking each of those down into its individual peptides um, on the Dairy Zoomer. So we're testing for thousands of peptides within each one of those proteins on the Dairy Zoomer. The Dairy Zoomer is also not a test for lactose intolerance. Uh, which is not an immune-based reaction to dairy. It does not involve any protein constituents of food, therefore no antibodies are generated. This protein, uh, I'm sorry, this question comes to the lab probably a couple times a month from both providers and patients that somebody says, well, I know that I'm lactose intolerant or my patient is lactose intolerant, yet the dairy zoomer was negative, your test must be wrong. Um, unfortunately, no, the lactose intolerance, as we discussed at the very beginning of this module, an intolerance has nothing to do with the immune system. There are no antibodies involved in it, and there will not be anything on this test that will indicate lactose intolerance. Not only that, but lactose is the sugar portion of dairy, and therefore there, um, there wouldn't be a protein component to it, so there's no peptides in lactose. Um, so just keep that in mind. This is not a test for lactose intolerance and it would not indicate that in any way. So what it is going to test for, casein and whey are the two main protein families found in milk products from all animals. The ratio of these proteins will vary by species, but all proteins in milks will generally fall into one of these two main families. Caseins typically do make up the majority of protein solids in most milks, including cow's milk. Um, with alpha casein and beta casein being the two most prevalent. A1 beta casein is the form found in about 90% or more of dairy products in the US, and it comes from cows derived from breeds in Northern Europe. A2 beta casein, which is you'll see specifically labeled as A2 products at like health food stores, comes from cows derived from stock from Southern Europe. It's also what's found in goat's milk, and it's also the form or isoform of casein found in human milk. A1 beta casein and A2 beta casein differ by only one amino acid. So we're talking, if you look at the entire chain of casein and we, we break it down, every single little pearl on that string for these is exactly the same type, shape, et cetera, except one. So there may or may not be support for lesser immune reactions seen from A2 cow's milk versus A1 cow's milk. And this is gonna vary by individual and we'll get into why this is. Antibodies to beta casein alone do not rule out sensitivity to A2 beta casein because they could be to either or both A1 beta casein and or A2 beta casein due to the extremely similar protein structure of the two. So to reiterate, an antibody to beta casein on the dairy zoomer could be to A1 or A2 beta casein. So just that one antibody in isolation does not rule in or rule out consumption of A2 beta casein being okay for a patient. Where there may be support for substitution of A2 cow's milk, if you're looking at dairy zoomer results, is if you also see beta casomorphin antibodies alongside beta casein antibodies. That particular combination, having both of those present, indicates a specific response to A1 beta casein, but not A2 beta casein. So let's talk about why that is. If you're looking at the full version of the dairy zoomer, where you get the little bubble comments that populate um, at the end of the report, 
that talk about each marker. Beta casomorphin is essentially a um, opioid type protein found in milk. And when it breaks down, the difference, th there's basically one residue different on the 67th residue. There is a histidine in place of a proline. Um, when that histidine is present, uh, which is in the in the case of I'm sorry, in the case of A1 casein, when histidine is present, digestive enzymes are able to lyse that bond between that histidine and the amino acid next to it, and it can then break off beta casomorphin. In the case of A2 milk the proline bond there to the amino acid next to it is not a bond that amino acid, I'm sorry, that uh, enzymes can break. And so it stays intact. The A2 casein does not break off casomorphin and the A2 casein stays intact as A2 casein. So in the case of A1 casein, beta casomorphin can be cleaved and beta casomorphin antibodies would indicate that the individual is making antibodies to casein, specifically from A1 milk. If you don't also have the beta casomorphin antibodies, you can't say for sure that A2 milk would not be problematic. So we can only say that someone is not sensitive to A2 milk when there are both beta casein and beta casomorphin antibodies. That's the only time. If there's only beta casein antibodies, we don't know for sure, without beta casomorphin antibodies present, we don't know for sure if the individual is not going to be sensitive to A2 milk. So this is where you would wanna use some caution and use your best clinical judgment. Um, when in doubt, leave it out is typically a good policy um, until you have healed the gut, you've got somebody's immune system back into a little bit more calm down state. So these are just some things to pull out from the dairy zoomer. There's, there's a lot more research that's been done into the antigenicity of dairy compared to lectins when it comes to human studies. Um, there definitely is some association with eye inflammation, so much like aquaporins and neuromyelitis optica. Um, this, the A2 casein um, and retinal S antigen overlap has some association with uveitis. So if a patient has a history of uveitis already diagnosed or eye inflammation, they would definitely want to eliminate cow milk long-term. Beta casein, of course, there's significant research into that. There's been associations made with type 1 diabetes in children. Um, if the individual has no history of diabetes, I would still suggest eliminating three to six months. Confirm barrier integrity. So again, you're going to retest the wheat zoomer or the intestinal permeability panel. There should be totally negative antibodies on that panel before in reintroducing this food. Um, if there's no beta casomorphin antibodies, A2 milk might be appropriate after that initial three to six month elimination. So again, they would not be a food you would want to trial in the early stages of healing this patient. A1 beta casein and islet cell overlap, there's some connection to, again, type one diabetes in children and um, in and, and young adults too, I think some of the research has shown adolescents into early 20s has some connection here. This would be someone that you would want to eliminate cow's milk long-term. And because of the connection with beta casein, um, and again, unless you're 100% clear and, and sure that A2 casein is not a problem, I would also make the statement that all other milks would probably be something that person would wanna eliminate, so goat milk or sheep milk because we can't know for sure that A2 casein is not problematic for them. Beta casomorphin, of course, um, if, if it's present alongside beta casein, I can't say this enough, um, there's specific sensitivity to A1 casein. A2 milk might be tolerated after an initial elimination and then com confirmation that that intestinal barrier is healed. So you don't wanna reintroduce this food if that intestinal barrier is not healed because you're basically going to just re- trigger all of the inflammation that was going on in the first place. Some other things to look at, um, beta lactoglobulin is, has significant homology with proteins made during pregnancy um, in humans, and this could influence autoimmune activity. The studies that have been done are again in their infancy, and there's not very clear 
causative um, influence here, whether or not autoimmune risk is really caused by this or if there's just this association. Um, and then of course, butyrophilin, this is a, a protein that is, breaking, that is broken down and it, um, as the peptides in dairy are cleaved, we see that this actually has some cross-reactivity with myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, so MOG. Um, we have on the neural zoomer plus, you can look at both anti-MOG as well as it has some association with um, anti-cerebellar and anti-Purkinje cell. So you would want to run a neural zoomer plus in an individual that has anti-butyrophilin antibodies because this can give you an idea of, especially if this person is younger and doesn't yet have any neurologic um, symptoms, but maybe it runs in the family, this might give you an idea of this person has some risk for that. Um, but particularly if they are already showing neurologic symptoms, um, this would be you know, a good justification to run a neural zoomer plus to assess perhaps that this food could be one reason why this individual has some of this um, symptom. So again, same, same process here, what to do with the results. IgA moderate or positive, you want to eliminate um, immediately. It's a shorter term elimination if it's only IgA. If you've got IgG moderate, you're looking at 30 to 60 days, you would want to retest the wheat zoomer or intestinal permeability before reintroducing these foods. Just make sure it's completely negative, no antibodies present on that panel um, before reintroducing any of these. IgG positive, these are your IgG more reactive foods. Those are longer term eliminations, 120 or more days, so six months or so. Um, again, retest that intestinal permeability to see, is it healed? Um, is this person back on track? Or are they at risk for the same type of immune responses um, if we bring this food back in and they're not ready for it? If you're seeing IgG moderate or positive um, with other disorders and symptoms, so these are those neural, um, optical, diabetes, et cetera, consider running additional testing. So again, neural zoomer plus, if you're seeing um, butyrophilin, you wanna look for anti-MOG, anti-cerebellum, anti-Purkinje cell. Possible long-term elimination of dairy if this person already has neurological inflammatory symptoms or conditions, just consider this may be a food that that person needs to cut out long term or you know potentially for the rest of their life depending on what their risk factors are and that is the end of this module join us in the next module where we will start breaking down some of the other food zoomers